Hi, and good afternoon, ladies. My name is Amelia Peacock. I'm the Gulf Coast Outreach Coordinator here with Grace After Fire. I come to you today with both Grace After Fire's mission, which is to provide the means for women veterans to gain knowledge, insight, and self-renewal, as well as the fact that it's Women's History Month. With both of those things in mind, we come today to provide you with an overview of some very valuable insights and tips for proper vehicle maintenance that everyone needs to be aware of. We want to ensure that you know as much as possible because as we all know, the proper knowledge applied appropriately is key. So given that, I'm here to introduce to you a person who's very near and dear to my heart, my father. He's been in the oil and heavy equipment industries as a mechanic for longer than I've been alive. To give you a brief overview before I allow him to introduce himself and share with you his credentials, I just wanna share with you not only did this man raise a Marine, However, he also taught me to be truly prepared for some of life's challenges. As I've gone through my adult life, I've been able to gain such a sense of accomplishment and pride in knowing that I'm knowledgeable and I am capable of taking care of my vehicle, especially in the case of an emergency, such as a flat tire. Being able to be confident in this area of my life also bleeds over into so many other areas and aspects. If I'm able to change my own tire, you better get out of the way because you never know what I might learn next. So ladies, get excited, get educated, and get prepared for the myth, the legend, my father, Billy Pat Peacock. Hello, my name is Billy Pat Peacock. I'm here today to talk with you a little bit about basic car maintenance, the kind of stuff you need just because you have a car, okay? I don't know if you're super intelligent on car fixing or if you don't know anything about it. However, I'm here to give you some ideals, some hints, some basic stuff that I go with and use every day in my life. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. I was raised in what we call West Texas, which is actually east of Lubbock, about 80 miles off the cap right there, small town called Roaring Springs. Raised up on a farm. We bailed hay, raised hogs, raised cows had a feed store, had a dry goods store. My daddy was the ag teacher. So, and my mother sold Avon too. So we was pretty busy all the time. My brother and I took care of most of the chores at the house, took care of the animals and all. We didn't go to town a lot because it wasn't that big, wasn't that much there. When something broke, we just fixed it ourselves. My dad grew up in the depression as well as my mom. So we just learned how to fix stuff. And you needed something ordered, you went to Sears and Roebuck catalog and found it. And when about three weeks later, you get one in the mail. If it wasn't snowing, which is kind of like what happened last week, but that's another story. Anyway, my background, raised in a small town on a farm, did pretty much everything ourselves. Went to Texas Tech for two years. While I was there, I worked for Sears and Roebuck, changing shocks and rotating tires and water pumps. Liked so much that much to my parents' dismay, I stopped going to college and went down to TSTC in Waco and got a certificate in heavy equipment mechanics. I took that, moved down down to Houston, went to work for Plains Machinery, working on international harvest dozers and galleon cherry pickers. Worked for Brown Roof for about 10 years in the oil field as an oil field mechanic, equipment superintendent. I worked with Mustang Tractor on the cat line and in the engine room as a supervisor. Worked for Rush Equipment Center as a warranty manager. I worked for United Rentals Heavy Equipment as a service manager. Uh, and then one day is like, I need to go back and finish my degree. From that, I come back down to the coast after I got my degree in, at Tech and work to work for TSTC as a heavy equipment instructor, teaching how to work on heavy equipment and diesel engines. So I got a pretty good background all the way around and working on this and that and that and this. And that would be, I guess you'd say my bio. Right now I'm working for the local high school, woodworking, small tools, things like that. Uh, work with a lot of kids, teach them the basics about woodworking tools, safety in the shop, life's experiences, and that's some of the stuff we work with every day. Well, let's talk about vehicle maintenance, taking care of your vehicle and taking care of yourself in the respect of what you need to do and how you need to do it for your vehicle. It's not hard. The stuff we're talking about is what I call daily maintenance or preventative maintenance. And it's easy to do and anyone can do it. I mean, I do it, so hey, I know everybody else can. Now, don't laugh at me, okay? 
I'm listening to an old man that's embraced the modern age. I know the majority of you have a cell phone, a smartphone, or what I call a smart aleck phone. Now, we're going to play a little game called Simon Says, but we're going to say Billy Says. So Billy Says, go get your smartphone and start taking some notes on it. Hit the pause button now and go do that. Well, that was a quick two seconds. I know you got your phone out. What you need to do is go out to your vehicle in broad daylight, back it out if you're in a parking place, back it out in the open, take a picture of it from all four sides, get the whole thing front to back, store them on your phone, make a little folder for it, take a picture of your inspection sticker up on the dash. While you're taking that picture, see if it's expired or what month it does expire. You need to be aware of that, okay? Walk on to the back of it or the front of it, whichever one's the cleanest, take a picture of your license plate. It's handy to have that, especially if you, you, just, you just need one of those, okay? Need that picture on your phone. Open the driver's door on your vehicle. Now, I'm not going crazy here, but trust me. If you open the driver's door on your vehicle and look down, you'll see two little decals on it. One's gonna be a VIN plate, and it's just a decal that's stuck on there now. And it's got a bunch of numbers and a barcode on it. Take a good picture of that. You may need information on your car sometime, and that's where it's all at. Now, there's one more decal you need to take a picture of. It's either going to be there on that post with your VIN number, or it's going to be on the door when you open it up. It's going to be yellow and white, and it's going to have information about your tires on it. Now, why is that important? Well, do you really want to go out to your car at 10 o'clock at night when you're trying to find a new tire to see what size they are and then get down on your hands and knees and look at it to see what it says? No, what you want to do is have those numbers handy. But more importantly, what that little tag has on it is what the air pressure is supposed to be on your, in your tires. Not on them, but in your tires. I know you always go to the side of the tire and look and it says maximum inflated pressure is X number of pounds. That's not the amount of air you should be driving in your tires every day. That's the maximum you want to put in. It's going to beat you to death. What you want to do is look at those numbers on that door there, and that's the amount of pressure you want in your tires. It'll tell you sometimes the front ones and the back ones have a different amount in them. It all makes a difference. And the big thing about the tires is it tells you how much pressure you're supposed to put in them. <clears throat> People come back here, and they look on this tire, and they go, oh, maximum pressure, 55 pounds. Well, let's air it up. Hello? That's the most you can put in it. It's going to beat you to death. You got hemorrhoids, you're really going to hurt, okay? <laughs> you look over here on this and it tells you these tires run 29 pounds. It says 44, but that's the maximum amount you can put them in. People try to air them up like that. It ain't right. Mm -hmm. So you look there, it'll tell you what you're supposed to put air in them. Did you take a picture of your license plate? I know you know your license plate, but if something happens, you need this picture, not just your memory police reports, whatever, you take that picture all the way around the vehicle so that if an accident or something happens, you've got proof it wasn't like that yesterday. One more thing, if you're really like me, you'll take a picture of your odometer every January 1st. That tells you how many miles in the vehicle, if you're using it for business or anything, you can track what you do during the year with that. Hey ladies, it's Amelia again, just real quick. I hope you still have that phone handy from your game of Billy Says. Get ready to jot these items down that you may want to keep track of when it comes to your vehicle. Let's see, we change the oil, you write it down. You change batteries, you write it down. When you go to buy new tires, write that down in the mileage. Because you'll be wondering down the road, have I gone over the warranty on these or have I still got warranty on them? Let's talk about flat tires. Yeah, I know, you can always call that good looking guy down the street or that good looking lady down the street to change your tire for you, right? Well, I'll tell you an embarrassing story. Guy stopped one time to help my daughter change her flats. I said, here, I'll change it for you, ma'am. About an hour later, she finally says, here, let me do this. He had no clue what he was doing. He looked good, but he just couldn't do it. Wouldn't you want to know how to do it in case somebody stops to help? Use their muscle, but use your brain. Well, first thing you need to do is locate the tools. So we need to go out to your vehicle. So just pause this right now, go out to your vehicle, set in the driver's seat, reach over, get the owner's manual out. 
I'll wait. Go ahead. Yeah, it's under those receipts from Pizza Hut. Dig it out of there, okay? There you go. Now, go in there and look for where it says changing a flat, okay? You need to locate where the tools are because they hide them in some weird places now. There's going to be a jack handle, a lug wrench, and the jack. Now, the jack handle and the lug wrench might be put together. So you may have to use both of them to get the jack to work and then use one of them to take the lug nuts loose. So I want you to stop the video right now, look in the owner's manual, find those tools, and then actually go and locate where they are in the vehicle and take them out of the vehicle as if you're going to change a flat. Okay, you're back now. Okay, here we go. You found the tools, and if you also notice, there's certain places under your vehicle now where the jack is supposed to fit. Back in the day, you just jacked up the bumper, changed it, and went on your way. Not the same anymore. They'll have little tabs or locations. Get down your hands and knees, look under there, and find out where they go. Even if you never change a flat, and that guy down the street does it for you, you don't want him messing up the underside of your car by putting it in the wrong place or watching it fall off the jack when you don't have a spare on there. So find out where those go, and then we'll come back again, and I'll wait for you. Okay, you're back again. Now, have you put the jack together to see how it works? I'd like you to actually stick it under there in one of those places, assemble it all, and turn it up until it gets tied against the car. In other words, so it starts to move the car a little. Okay, take it back down after you do that, and put it back in the vehicle. You now know how to put it together, how it works, and where it goes. <clears throat> That's very important to do it now instead of wait till it's raining, the middle of the night, or you're in the wrong neighborhood and trying to learn it then. Because AAA don't always show up when you want them to. Okay? Good. Now, did you check the air pressure in your spare? Because they go flat, they leak down, they slowly deflate. And that's one thing you want to check every time you change oil is the air pressure on your spare. I've never thought of that. The wrong time to check it is when you put it on your car as a spare. You let the jack down and the tire goes all the way to the ground and it's flat. Not a good sign. So check that air pressure in that spare every time you change your tires. <laughs> change your oil or rotate your tires. Good thing there. Okay. We've learned how to use the jack. We've taken it out of the car. We've put it back in. We know how it works. We know where the parts are. Now let's talk about that one thing you never, never really want to do. Change a flat. When you have a flat, you pull off the road as much as possible. Put on your flashers. I don't care if it's day or night. Even if you're in a parking lot, okay? Somebody will try to run over your vehicle just because it's there. Put your flashers on and then set your parking brake. Even if the brake is not on the wheel you're changing, it'll keep the car from rolling, and that's important for us. So put your jack under it now, bring it up, get a little tension against it, loosen the lug nuts on the wheel. Don't take them off yet, just loosen them. First thing you got to remember is which way the little nuts go, the little lug nuts, right? Righty, tighty, lefty, loosey. Let me make this simple. Let's pretend a water bottle, hold it in your hand, is the tire. And the little cap on is the lug nuts. Now, you can do this with an empty water bottle or a full one. It's up to you, okay? If you can take the lid off of that water bottle, that's how the nuts come off the wheel. And you put them back on the same way you tighten the lid back on. Now, if you had a full water bottle, it's probably now emptier and you're wet. But that's okay. You've learned something. Now, you need to loosen those lug nuts a little bit. Once you put the jack under and got it slightly tight against the car, loosen the lug nuts. Get them loose a little bit. Raise the wheel on up off the ground where you can slide your hand under it. You don't need a lot of clearance, but about that much. Take your lug nuts off. Put your spare on. And then put them on like you put them on the water bottle, okay? Don't go in a circle. Do a star pattern here, 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 here. Doing a star pattern as you snug them up and then finally tighten them up. When you can tighten them no more, let it down off of the jack and then finish tightening them as much as you can. And the next thing you need to remember to do is take the jack out, put it all up, put the, the flat tire back in, 
and go get it fixed. Don't forget about it. So I'm going to do it next week. Go get it taken care of now. Okay. And then be sure that they put everything back in its correct place in your car so it doesn't rattle. And if you have another flat, you have your tools where you need them. Let's talk about something I feel is very important, and that's tire wear and balanced tires and rotating tires. But gosh, why? They're not worn out. Tire wear is an easy thing to look at. You can check it yourself. You know when you rotate your tires, when you change your oil about once a month, walk around your car, look at your tire from in the front end, under the bumper, look at it. Does it have worn spots? Does it have little scallop pieces on the edge? Is the thread real thin in the middle and fat on the sides or vice versa? If it is, you have some issues. If the tire is like this, the tread's gonna wear out in the center and the thread's gonna be deep on the sides so your tires are overinflated. If the tread's deep in the middle and worn out on the edges, it's underinflated. So you need to check those tire pressures. If it's got cuts or it's worn on the edges, you have a front end alignment issue. Go down to someone and have them check it out. Now here's the deal about worn tires from a bad alignment. If your tires are worn severely on the outside or on the inside, just getting a new alignment will not solve the problem. You'll need to move those tires to the rear and or replace them because once they get that wear pattern in them, you can't correct it by doing an alignment. The tire's set and how it works and you have to change it out or move them to the back until you can afford to buy some new ones for it. Alignments are very important. Normally, most cars now don't need alignments very often at all. If you drive a lot of rough roads, run over curbs, things like that, you probably need to get them checked a little more often, okay? Another thing we need to talk about is balancing your tires. I balance my tires, make sure they're smooth. If tires are not balanced, they're gonna be doing this minutely, but all the time they're doing this, they are wearing away at the bearings and the spindles in your vehicle. Not good for you, not good for the vehicle. A simple test on tire balancing, get on a pretty decent road, drive at 50, 60 miles an hour, and put your hand on top of the steering wheel like this. Just stick your finger out. Don't hold it out stiff. Just stick it out there that hang. If it's doing this, you probably have a balance issue. Okay, speed up a little, see what it does, slow down a little. I'd say 50, 60 miles an hour will probably tell you. Uh, if it's shaking a lot, go down and have them balanced. See if that makes a difference, okay? That's something to think about. Easy to do, keeps your tires wearing better, and it keeps you in better condition with your vehicle. Seems like all we talk about is tires and air pressure, isn't it? Well, here's something else we want to talk about. The nightly news. No, we'll skip the nightly news for now, okay? Talk about rotating your tires. Why do you need to rotate your tires? I mean, you drive on them every day. Okay, I live about eight miles from town. I make four turns between my house and where I park at work. So that's eight turns a day, 180 days a year. And I rotate my tires every 5,000 miles. Now, if I was a used car salesman, I was driving the highways 100,000 miles a year, I probably wouldn't rotate them every 10,000. But if you're doing in-town traffic, in-town driving, I would say 5,000 miles between rotations is the maximum, not a minimum. You're turning your tires all the time. You're turning corners, going through parking lots. You need to rotate your tires, okay? It's, it's a big deal. It doesn't cost that much. It keeps the wear even on them and extends the life of your tires. It also gives you a chance to look at those tires. And if you're not going to do them yourself, another professional checks them and says, hey, I know it's a little wear here. Maybe we should see what's happening to keep your tires lasting longer for you. Always rotate your tires. Do it the same every time. How do you know which way is the same every time? You've got your notes on your smartphone, right? Made some little notes. Rear to front, front across, or front to rear, rear across. You do that every time, your tires will move all four positions consistently, okay? Be sure you rotate those tires, it matters. One last thing about tires, when you have to go buy something. It's kinda like financing a house, isn't it? But you know, here's the funny, the last two times I bought tires for my vehicles, I financed them. No, I didn't go down and get me a credit card. Well, actually I did, 
but they gave me six months financing on one with no interest. So I had six months to pay them out. And on the other set, because there were more, they gave me a year to pay them out with no interest. So I used their money to pay my tires, to pay them out slowly over 12 months. <clears throat> Worked out great. Now, you got to remember to make sure you get all them payments in on time or you'll be paying all the interest in a lump sum at the end. But when you buy tires, you need to think about, am I buying these to last for a long time because I plan on keeping the vehicle a long time? Or do I, am I going to drive another 20000 and then trade it off? Why buy 85,000 mile tires when you're only going to drive twenty or 30000 on them? Buy some tires that fits the distance you're going. If you plan on living in this car forever, get the higher mileage tires. If you don't, don't buy those. Use your money on the new vehicle. Uh, I'm going to recommend a company. I normally don't do that. Discount tire. I've used them for, oh gosh, 30 years now, I guess, 25. They're everywhere in Texas. They rotate your tires for free. They fix your flats for free. They've always treated me well. You get extended warranty or extended, I think it's called a road hazard on your tires. You blow a tire out on the side of the road, you have a flat. Most tires now when you have a flat, if you're driving, they're bad. You go down there, they change it out. Sometimes they prorate them and sometimes you just get a new tire. But the cost of tires now, it's really something to consider. Go down and talk to them. They've been pretty fair on the prices. They'll finance your tires for you as well. They're really good people. I've always had good luck with them. But think about this, when you're buying those tires, are you going to use all that tire or are you just going to use part of it and trade it off for something else? Look at your dollars, look at your time, and make a wise decision on that. Let's talk about oil changes. When do you change your oil? When there's none left in the car, wrong time to do it, okay? When do you check your oil? Ah, how do you check the oil? Ah, okay, if you know how to open the hood on your car, it's easy. If you don't know how to open the hood on your car, learn how to open the hood. Once we get the hood open, look for the bright yellow little handle, or it may be a little red handle. That's the oil dipstick. Have a Kleenex in your hand, some toilet paper, an old rag. Pull the dipstick out, wipe it off, put it all the way back in, pull it out again. Do not hold it up, hold it flat. Why flat? If you hold it up, the oil is going to run down, give you an inaccurate reading. Hold it flat or like this. See where your oil level is. It's between the low and the high mark, you're okay. But what if it gets to the low mark? Well, you need to add oil. What kind? Somewhere up at the front of the engine, there's going to be a round thing with a little handle on it, and it says oil fill. And most of the time, on top of that, it'll tell you the weight of the oil that goes in that engine. If all else fails, look in the owner's manual, right? You know, the thing in the glove box with the Pizza Hut receipts? That's the place. So, you check the oil, how often you check it? If you just bought the car and it's not brand new, I would check it once a week. Check it on Sunday morning when the engine's cold until you start seeing it's not using the oil or it's consistent. Then maybe go to once a month. If you feel comfortable with it, not using oil. It's, it all depends on you, you know, because when it runs out of oil, you lost an engine. So check that oil pretty frequently for a while. While you're under there, you can look for leaks or drips. Wet spots on your engine usually indicate a leak of some kind. Check those out. Now, while we're talking about oil, let's talk about oil changes. Unless you're really in the mood, <clears throat> I wouldn't recommend changing your own oil anymore. You can get it done so many places so inexpensively anymore. Now, when you have your oil change, you need to what? Write down your mileage, write down the date. If you drive very little, you need to change your oil at least every six months or every 5,000 miles, whichever comes first. Why change it if I don't drive the miles? Up to 25% of every quart of oil is additives. Those additives deplete over a period of time and leave your oil without the capability to protect your engine. So if you drive very little, acids forming the oil causing problems with your engine, 
you need to change it oil at least every six months or every 5,000 miles. Some car manufacturers now recommend every 10,000. <sighs> I just can't go there. I just, 5,000 is good to me. Now, also, when you change oil, do you change filter? Absolutely. I mean, you change T-shirts every time you change shirts, don't you? Why wouldn't you change filters, right? Keep everything clean. Keep it together. Changing your oil, 5,000 miles or every six months, whichever comes first, is a recommended practice. Now, what about that air filter? Do you change it every time you change oil? When I lived in Lubbock, I did. It's windy and dusty up there. Down here along the coastline, I'll probably go 20, 30,000 miles between air filters. I pull it out, check it, pull a few bugs out of it, tap it a little bit. Doesn't look dusty or dirty. I put it back in and run it for a while. Up around Lubbock, though, when you pull your oil filter, or not your oil filter, but your air filter out, it's usually pretty nasty. So check that air filter when you do your oil change. And I know the guy may come over to you and say, hey, you need to change that air filter. Look in your notes and see if it's been a while. Ask him, is it really dirty or are you just recommending this? Because sometimes our air filters can get expensive, especially, and you can do it yourself. It's real easy. Okay? So oil change and air filters, something to check out there. You know, you check your oil once a week at first and then about once a month after that till you're comfortable with about how much you're using or not using. At the same time you're under that hood, you're looking around for wet spots and leaks. You're going to look on top of that battery and see if there's any white, dusty-looking stuff around your battery terminals. That's acid. That's dried acid. Most of the time now, you don't check the water level in your batteries because they're all sealed. But that white, fluffy stuff around your battery terminals is acid. It gets on your clothes. It'll eat them away. It gets on your hands. It'll burn them. It gets in your eyes. It will make you cry forever. It's not good for you. Take a water hose. Flush it for about five minutes, wash all over the top of the battery, and then wash the whole engine area where you were washing the battery to get that acid to flush down off of the vehicle. While you're checking that battery for its condition, making sure it's clean, check your windshield wiper fluid. It's usually right up front by the radiator. It'll say windshield wiper fluid on it, or it may have a little insignia icon like this on the top of it. I use Rain-X. I bought it at Wally World. It's good stuff. If you're on the Gulf Coast, it's green. If you get further up country, it's orange. Why? Well, the orange is for winter driving. The green is for summer. Since I go back and forth between the coast and northwest Texas a lot, I usually keep mine kind of a, uh, it's a grungy color because I mix the green and the orange together because it gives me some antifreeze protection with it. But, so you check your water and your battery. Well, you don't need more. You just want to check the top of the battery. Make sure it's clean. Check your windshield washer fluid. Keep it topped off. You know how to check your engine oil. There's a reservoir now for your radiator. Rarely anymore do we take the top off the radiator and look in it. There'll be a small reservoir bowl right by it, and that's where you would add your fluid to it. Never add fluid to your radiator when it's hot. Do it when it's cold. Remember, you're going to go out once a week and check your tire pressure and check your engine oil and all, that's when you look at that little radiator bowl and see if it's full. Same thing with power steering fluid. Normally, you don't see very many vehicles anymore leaking power steering fluid. That's when you look for those drips under the vehicle. If you park in the same place every day, when you go to back out, look up there. Is there a wet, shiny spot now? You need to see why it's there. Okay, if you don't park in the same place, Maybe you should slide under your corner piece of cardboard and look up and see if there's some wet things. Something to consider, okay? These would indicate leaks in your vehicle. Something to check out. You don't have to worry about fixing them, but you have to know that they're there and be aware of them. There's one last thing we want to talk about. You know, All through this video, I kept telling you to look at the owner's manual. The one in the glove box with the Pizza Hut receipts, right? The one that, yeah, it's got chewing gum stuck to it. A lot of the new cars don't come with a owner's manual. I have two for my pickup. One of them's about this thick. It takes up like half my glove box. But using and embracing new technology, I go to the manufacturer's website and I download the three owner's manuals for my vehicle. They have a whole manual now just on how to use the, the radio, you know, the 
audio visual navigation system. Then there's another one that tells me what all the little gauges are on the dash and the little idiot lights that come on that look weird because we don't know what they are. I would recommend you spend an hour or two sitting in your vehicle and it's like a quiet time for you, okay? Don't play the radio. Just sit in it, go through the owner's manual and look at the instrument cluster and learn what all those little things are. It's better to know ahead of time what those lights are than being in traffic and one of them comes on and you're going, oh my gosh, what is this? What's happened now? Look at the instrument panel. Learn what the cluster lights are. You might even figure out what some of those other buttons are for you push. But download your owner's manual. It's not that hard. You can even find older owner's manuals, uh, older owner's manuals on the internet and download them for free. Why not? They're handy. You write there on your phone. You've got your specifications, your oil levels, your capacities and everything right there with you all the time. Remember, use your phone with your vehicle. <clears throat> take pictures, take notes, keep it on your phone, put it in the cloud. I sound that word, cloud. And it's always there handy for you whenever you need it. You have questions? No problem. Give me a holler. Hey ladies, thank you so much for joining us today for this video. I hope you got a lot of good knowledge, a lot of practical hands-on things that you can apply to life. I'm very excited for future information to be, that we'll be putting out, future educational information that we'll be putting out. So please stay tuned. Uh, make sure that you check out our website at www.graceafterfire.org. Check on our events calendar. It has everything that's coming up, our women in construction that's coming up, all of the different events that we'll be having. So please stay tuned and we look forward to seeing you soon.